Welcome to the Interesting Podcast, episode number 205. The guest today is my friend, Kevin Yost. He's a senior editor at Lucasfilm who's responsible for some of the coolest trailers ever. We're talking Clone Wars, Rebels, Star Wars Celebration, you name it. In this episode, we talk about working through the pandemic, Kevin playing hockey growing up, originally wanting to be a herpetologist, how he got into editing, starting out as a PA, working at a trailer house, how technology has changed over the years, getting his job at Lucasfilm, and so much more. Kevin is not only a fantastic learning resource for trailer editing, he's also just a genuinely good dude, and I'm so excited for you all to get to know him. So, without further ado, please enjoy this episode of The Interesting Podcast, number 205, with Kevin Yost. Theme song time! things busy crazy uh fun exciting scary yeah all the good all that, stuff all the things that make make us who we are i guess I think so too better than boring i find yes i was just thinking the last time i saw you was mm-hmm. september of 2019 it's almost three years ago oh no no almost four years ago oh yeah it's 2023 right <laughs> so, yeah See? my god um, oh wait i saw you twice Okay, so I saw you at Chicago. That was right. April of 2019. And then I saw you at work in September of 2019. Oh, that's right. That's yeah. right. Yeah. That's right. It's you, a different world right. now. It's almost, I'm sure a lot of people feel this way, but for me, it's almost like this vacuum of time yeah. where it's, it's especially, I don't know your work situation, if you were working at home exclusively or whatnot. Mm-hmm. But for me, I was working at home. You know, my kids were, you know, for that first year, they were at home doing school remote. Right. And then things, you know, began to loosen up a little bit. Um, And, but I guess from 20, like, was it March, 2020 Mm -hmm. to sort of late 2022, everything was just sort of the here, there, everywhere. So many things happened and, and you try to think like, oh, that was the summer we did this. But you, we really didn't do anything. Like it's right? hard for me to sort of have these demarcation lines of of events, because I don't know. It, yeah, it, it sort of blends together, and and that time sort of jumps forward. It's almost like the blip, right? Yeah, <laughs> I think the same thing. It's like none. This didn't happen, but then it right. did. But then you're like, how do we process this? I feel like in like maybe five more years, we'll have a better grasp of like what was that. Yeah, you know that's the hope. I mean. <laughs> I do know that, yeah, I mean, not to get too deep there, but I do know that a lot of teenage kids, it, it hit them hard. Oh, I bet. Um, and I, and I think in particular, speaking from, from my experience. Yeah. I think it hit uh, teenage girls particularly hard. Sure. Uh, sure. I think, um, not to overgeneralize, but totally. Uh, uh, my son had, he was playing video games and, and he had sort of that. Sure. My, my daughter doesn't do that. Um, oh, so right. She, she was, you know, home and reading books and watching movies and things like that. But she wasn't necessary. I mean, there was, again, you have the, the iPhone and smartphones and, and what mm-hmm. and Android phones to, to connect and view things and, and talk to people, uh, you FaceTime. Right. Uh, but it, it just wasn't the same. Yeah, that, it is you know, different. So I think hopefully that generation of, of young women uh, come out on the other side of this in, in a good place. I'm sure they will. Women are just smarter. They'll figure it out. Yeah. I have nieces and nephews that are all super young right now. And it's so fun to see the differences in like the girl is two years younger than the boy, but is clearly smarter. It is like, what? why is he still eating dirt? What are you doing? Yeah, I, yeah, I, don't, I don't know what it is, I, I, you know. <laughs> The the young ladies in the world they just they just 
they just figure things out so much faster and they do how things their clocks are sped up a little bit and the brain's like we're just gonna we're gonna skip here you're just gonna be yeah. ahead so yeah i the resilient i find i'll make that generalization <laughs> yeah has over over the course of like because i'm trying to think about these time blips over the course of the last like three years has mm -hmm. your job gotten different because you're working on a computer or do the computers just in a different place? Like, did you have to the have a learning in a different curve? place? Like, I yeah, uh, okay, that's good. Uh, uh, editing uh, picture has been on computers for years now. Right, uh, right. Uh, really, the the only thing that has changed is just the acceleration of the ability to do it. I, I'm sure people could do it prior sure. to, to this happening, but yeah, us what we were doing. Uh, because of the the nature of the content we deal with, mm -hmm. we can't have media at home. Oh, uh, sure. Right. So, gotcha. basically, they figured out a way for all of us to access things remotely. Gotcha. So, okay. So okay. I have a computer here at home that connects through various stages and security protocols to right. work, and then I can and then I connect to a machine there. Oh, and cool! I, I, it's essentially it's it's remote desktop or I was about or, to say it's like really uh, remote. Yeah. Um, what a time to be alive. But uh, yeah, and um, I have a pretty fast connection. So nice. Do well. Um, does the does the eye scans and the fingerprint pads? Does that is that uncomfortable? <laughs> <laughs> you get used to the routine. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um. Yeah. So I I think a lot of folks that are yeah. doing the entertainment industry that are in post-production were doing that. And there was a lot of uh, articles that came out in the editorial uh, the editors union has a, has a magazine that comes out periodically and mm -hmm. they were talking about workflows and things like that. And Oh, interesting. Well, the, the time between when I was an assistant editor and now it's yeah. so different, so different. Oh, I bet. Um, and that, I, I, in theory, I sort of understand what they're doing, but if you were to sit me down and go, okay, you have to take over the assistant duties on this show, I would yeah. be fairly lost. It would take me a while <laughs> to, to sort of catch up because right. there's completely different codecs and ways to export and how uh, things are, you know, color spaces and that's all, all sorts of things to consider. Yeah. Um, uh, technology is so fast too. It's like oh, yeah. once it once it gets going, I think about that a lot because I was born in that weird generation where I was born in 91. So mm -hmm. I didn't get Internet until I was like in middle school. And then I also was uh, a pretty impoverished. So we got like the iPod would come out. But then like a year later, you would get the MP3 player. They like mm -hmm. just did the same thing, but kind of didn't. And it okay. was to see how technology they'd come up with something. And then within a year, come up with like three or four offshoots. Mm -hmm. And then by the time you got that one, they came out with the new one. So technology is just constantly growing right. and changing and learning. Like right. this does a thing in a button now where before you'd have to do this. And it's so fast. Yeah. It's yeah. Crazy. I don't know. Do you, do you remember things like Napster and all? Oh, those? yeah. LimeWire okay. destroying yeah. computers <laughs> everywhere. <laughs> well, <laughs> well, I didn't really get it. I, I wasn't diving into that realm. I don't recommend all. it. It was because I was, I was, I was a techno phobe at that point. Oh, sure. <laughs> um, but <laughs> funny story, like don't listen to Kevin to get future technology advice. I remember, <laughs> I remember talking to a guy um, in the, when I was an assistant editor working on this, Avid had this thing called audio vision, which was, oh, uh, cool. which was their sound editing counterpart to media composer, which is their picture editing thing. Got it. And Good name. Um, I was doing a lot of cool stuff with them. I was beta testing. I was, I was, and I went to this event and there's another guy that I had become friends with who was also doing sort of the same thing I was. Mm -hmm. And he would go to the same events and he was talking about, yeah, my buddy and I were talking about digitizing, you know, music on into the cloud. And I don't know if he said necessarily cloud, but he was talking about sure. iTunes. Got it. <laughs> and, I, and I was, and I sat there and I was like, why, why would you want to do that? I, that, that just... <laughs> And, and that's not going to catch well, on. Well, well, yeah. <laughs> well, part part of that was what we would do. Then we would take a CD uh, with music and we would 
we would digitize it into the media composer or or audio vision and it would take a while at that time all the metadata wouldn't come across so it would just be trial oh. one and then you would have to go and name it and artists do all that kind of stuff so oh yeah um, it was there it just wasn't what it is now sure i just thought like to myself why would you i like having the physical yeah record or you know i came from having right so record or or, or cd and etc cetera, etc cetera. and so flash forward to itunes i mean you can't even find a cd nowadays you find it, <laughs> find them at the thrift store or goodwill or markets or something with no way to play them <laughs> and then i just sort of chalk that up like don't listen to kevin right <laughs> noted that's an that's an important disclaimer <laughs> Uh, the most recent one, and I, you know, Dan, do you know Daniel Kennedy? You know Daniel. Oh Kennedy. yeah, yeah, DK. Yep. Okay, so great dude. When he when he was at Lucasfilm, and and Daniel, if you're listening, you'll you'll. Excuse He's me. why we got shirts. No, we got Star Wars shirts because yes. of Daniel. So he designed that the really famous Ahsoka sort of jersey for yes. for universe. <laughs> I don't know. I don't even want to admit this. So he was at work <laughs> and he was showing stuff, and he's like, "What do you what do you think of this?" And, you know, I'm not a fan of horizontal stripes. Got I don't, it. you know, it's not flattering to me. Sure. So he was showing this thing. It had horizontal stripes. It had this thing. I was like, I go, that's cool. It's like, I'm I'm not too keen on the horizontal stripes thing. Flash forward. It's it's probably their top selling. Like the best selling yeah. piece. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Hands down. <laughs> that's good to know. Do the do the anti Kevin and you will find some sort yes, of success. I'm so glad he didn't listen to me. <laughs> Daniel, thank you for not listening to me on that. Or maybe he did. And it was just like, I'm just going to do the opposite of what Kevin tells me. He cracked the code early. See? He's got no fashion sense. I always knew, <laughs> I always knew he was a visionary. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> the anti-visionary Kevin Yost. <laughs> I'm into it. <laughs> so if you're, what kind of stuff were you into growing up? Because then you're a technophobe beforehand. Like, well, oh. well, I, I will. That's not 100% accurate. And I was, okay. I'm not an early adopter of. of got that. it. Okay. It's you great. pick up once it's tried and true. Yeah, I'm not, like, I'm okay. not keen. I, I, you know, I was beta testing stuff for for avid uh-huh and i just know all of the the hiccups and things that oh happen. sure you're seeing how the soup's made and you're like yeah I, th that program audio vision made our life so easy basically at that point i was an assistant editor slash sound editor for for a trailer house and right. things would quote unquote go to finish you'd have to take it from essentially the offline editor okay also to backtrack the, the editors weren't editing in full resolution the, the oh. capability just was not there sure You're not and it's um so nowadays you can digitize stuff it's digitized at 4k you can edit it sure. you can export it you can export a file you're done yeah that wasn't the case then so they would hand it off to the finishing team and then they would prep the sound and prep the picture and then you'd go to a mix house and you'd mix it and et cetera, et cetera. gotcha okay so i was doing all of those things on the audio vision and we were beta testing because it was a fairly new program. Mm -hmm. And one one time, it's like a Thursday or early Friday, and we couldn't, what, what you would do is you would export essentially the edit from the media composer okay. onto a drive. And then you would bring that into the audio vision and then all of the 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 edits would be there in the timeline. And then you, oh. could, you could, it's completely normal now. You do that all the time now. Sure. You know? Files, right but then that was a novel idea and so all of the tracks would be there and the dialogue and, and the music and the effects and i would bounce the tracks and separate the tracks so that it would be ready for a mixer but i would also add in sound effects and 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 replace the dialogue with clean dialogue etc cetera, etc cetera. sure so you would edit <laughs> right so we had we had a a mix monday morning on a mm -hmm. on a big project and this thing it was crashing constantly Ooh. And there was no way for me to, to work on this. And so you panic call the, the tech support, uh, the, uh, the, you know, basically you get the bat phone line right to the, the top guys dealing with the program when you're a beta tester. Sure. And, and what it was, was it was just a colon, what? you know, you would export the file. The file would be the name of the project and the name of the TV spot or the trailer. And then mm -hmm. it would be colon if it was a tv spot it would typically be the editor would typically go colon 30 for a 30 second spot or colon 60 ah, got it etc and we had multiple tv spots we had to do for for that monday and it was the colon that was causing the hiccup and then wow. they found that out late friday and so we were able to to fix it 
but that's the kind of thing where I don't want to, I don't want to spend sure. money and then find <laughs> out that it's, oh, you have to charge the iPad upside down in order for it to get a full charge. You know what I mean? Uh, so I don't blame you. Like, wait till the kinks are done and then I'll be right, into it. Right. Yeah. I Let respect someone that. Else test that stuff for me. Yeah. <laughs> so growing up, I'm sorry, totally sidetracked. So growing no, no, up, no, please. Gosh, uh, you know, I think I, I grew up playing hockey uh, very early. Cool. Uh, I, you know, I think like any kids, you know, there were sports in my life. I loved animals, loved dinosaurs, loved Godzilla movies, the kaiju stuff. I, I you know, I rode BMX bikes, and and um, you know, we played touch football. I lived on a street where there were no sidewalks and there were hardly any traffic. So oh, you could, great! Basically, we would the kids in the neighborhood. We'd all collect on. We'd play on the street. We played, dude, football on the street. You know, touch football on the street. That's awesome. You didn't have to keep yelling car every five minutes? No, you, we did, but oh. the, the corner was far <laughs> enough away, and people didn't drive fast in that neighborhood. Okay, that's pretty cool. Gosh, yeah, you, know, you know, my dad, you know, he played some golf, so I was playing a little bit of golf with him. Uh, then I got into fly fishing. Um, Sweet. I, I've done a little bit of everything. That's thing. good. But yeah, as a youth, that was kind of it. Um, hockey has always sort of been my first love. Yeah. Uh, as you can see here yeah right <laughs> these are actually pen these are pennants from when i was a little kid what? Um, and That's i would go cool. to the games what position did you play i i played goalie the best position <laughs> yeah but it's it's you gotta have a little bit of a screw loose i think that's or why little, it's the best it's a little, it's a little bit different <laughs> yeah in a good way and if you don't have one when you go in you'll for sure have one eventually <laughs> right but I, I can i can remember as a little kid and i didn't at that time hockey wasn't as glamorous a sport sure it's still it's still a, it's not as popular here in the, in the states it is right and whatnot but then it was really a backseat to baseball and football um sure i remember as a kid growing up and telling people i played hockey and, and they would be my dad's friends or some other people that i had met and I, oh i played goalie like oh you got all your teeth <laughs> i just i just remember as a little kid going of course i got all my teeth like i don't and right. it didn't hit me until later that, oh, yeah. Right. The, you know, those guys typically, you know, the forwards and the defensemen didn't always have all their teeth. And even nowadays, that, that's that's fairly common. You either have a screw loose or a tooth loose. Yeah. Like, choose your poison. <laughs> um, but yeah, that, that was that was pretty cool. And then and then I stopped playing hockey through middle school and high school. And then I got back into playing hockey in college and then ever since. But at that point, playing goalie was just too expensive. Sure. I don't know if you're, the goalie gear is, is really expensive. Super pads. Yeah. And, but, but the cool thing is if you're a goalie, oftentimes uh, the teams or the leagues will waive your fee or that it's a dra it's a severely reduced play because there's not a whole lot of goalies out there and they want teams, you know, to have a goalie. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's a fair want. So I got into playing forward and defense So forward and defense, or I can play either that. Do you have a preference? Uh, I enjoy playing forward, but maybe as I slow down in my age, defense is more sure. <laughs> is more fitting for me. You have joints. Yeah, <laughs> but I enjoy doing both. I love that you have like both ends of the like interest spectrum where like you're really into sports. Mm -hmm. But also, where did being a herpetologist come into the, all of this? Oh, gosh. Um, do I know things or do I know things, Kevin? Yeah, hmm. you know, I must have told you that at one hmm. point. Hmm. Um, that Well, gosh, I... I don't know. I think it probably came when I was really young. I had a pet frog. It was a frog. I was going to ask yeah. what it was. What kind of frog was it? Dude, I love frogs. It was a, a, just a Western tree frog. Oh, it's so cool. And, you know, I had had that for a while. Um, didn't have really a proper terrarium for it because we didn't quite know how to take care of it. You know, I had I had a gravel base. I had some moss and a rock and a, tr and a branch that it could go on and I would spray it with water and Cool. It was, kind of in, it was kind of in this jar almost, like a jar that was sort of a terrarium thing. And then one day came home from school. Oh no. Our cat our cat came in and got in my room and knocked it over. Oh. And the frog got out. Okay. Okay. And never saw the frog again. <laughs> oh, <no. laughs> but <laughs> here's here's the sad thing. So I was worried the cat ate it. Um, so was I. Uh, but they didn't. Uh, I think a week later, my sister had found it dried up on the carpet. Oh, no. it had, so, <laughs> horrible end to George oh, Frog. No. 
<laughs> George, <laughs> solid name. George the Frog. <laughs> and you're like, I should learn to do this for real. I will become a herpetologist. Yeah. And then in San Francisco, there was the this thing called the Steinhardt Aquarium, which now they've they've rebuilt in what's called the Academy of Sciences. Mm -hmm. And they had tons of snakes and reptiles and amphibians and all kinds of things. And they had this huge pit of of uh of alligators and yeah. Um, and <laughs> there was just a railing. Oh, no. <laughs> thing. Yeah. The good it old was, days before yeah. safety. <laughs> um, and that just sort of fascinated me. And then and then in high school, I, I had I took biology and my biology teacher sort of she was into herpetology and she and her friends or, uh, organized a desert trip and spring break. Oh, myself and a bunch of other uh, students from her classes. We went on a on a desert camping trip for the spring break. That's so and, cool. You know, there were adults there and she had some of her former college friends who were in herpetology and we went and we would go and um we'd go to the Mojave Desert in California and you know we I guess for the week we'd sort of go to maybe three or four different places to to spend the day and the night. Mm -hmm. Um and we'd go and look for for lizards and things like that. And it was just sort of to learn about the desert, but all of a sudden I'm in this area and I can, it's like being at, at summer camp again, where you would, you would get a, a big giant foxtail weed, if you will, and take all the foxtails off and you would sort of make a, a slip knot noose. Right. And you could put it over the, the, the fence lit, the Western fence lizard. for me, it was the Western fence lizard and you would sort of catch it or the blue belly lizard. Right. Oh, and that's cool. how you caught it. But here it was one of the people we were with had an old sort of expanding bait rod, like a, um, it wasn't a fishing rod, but it was, um, um, a rod that people would use to, to catch bait fish with. Oh, okay. And, and they would just like, had a little, a slip knot of, of suture on the, on the end and they would catch lizards and we would look at it and kind of measure it and kind of see what, and, and some of the lizards in the desert have these fantastic colors. There's these deep aqua blues and these oranges what? and these greens. Yeah. On their belly. It's really fascinating. Yeah. Um, and that just, that just clicked. And I thought that was just the coolest thing. I thought, man, this would be the coolest thing to traipse around the desert or the jungle catching lizards and things like that. So yeah. there were all kinds of things. We in those trips we saw all kinds. We saw Western rattlesnakes, Mojave green Ooh. rattlesnakes, uh Ooh. A, a California desert tortoise. Oh, that's cool. Little burrowing owls. Those are neat. The little guys. Yeah. That that sort of was where that happened. And then I went to college thinking I was going to be a herpetologist or some doing something with animals. Really? And, and I was taking some film classes on the side outside of my major. And then I sort of realized that I wasn't interested in the hard science of, of things. I was more interested in sort of the, the nature element of things. And, or the hardest thing was going to school and being graded on a curve and you're competing against other kids that want to go to med school or oh sure things like that and they're taking the science classes and i just i just got lost you're like i want to play with the lizards well and it wasn't fun for me anymore and biology chemistry and physics in high school i had to work at but it was interesting and it was fun but when i got to college chemistry went from <laughs> being I don't know. Have you ever taken chemistry and balanced an no. equation, a chemistry equation? No, Kevin, I am not that smart. Okay. <laughs> I barely passed algebra. I'm, prob one. I'm probably getting this wrong, but you would get, in high school, you'd get a chemistry equation. You'd have to balance it. Um, I could I, don't ask me how, what that involves anymore. Cause I <laughs> couldn't tell you the irony that I can't balance an equation, Kevin. That compartment of my brain is, is long gone, um, <laughs> but let's just say it was 10 or 12 characters long or, or sure or element long. It went from that to being the whole length of the chalkboard in a lecture hall. Oh. If you've ever been to a lecture hall that seats 300 plus students, you know how big those chalkboards are. And uh. that was just sort of a metaphor for my for my, <laughs> my horrible experience. <laughs> yeah. And and so at the time I was taking those classes, those were really cool. And and growing up, I had always sort of with friends, we sort or we sort of messed around with making movies on a Super Eight, or or my sister's friends would make movies, and I was the youngest, and they would you know drag me along because I complained too much if they they weren't including <laughs> me, and we'd go and make monster movies, etc. And so I was doing that, and my my sister, who's older than me, she was already working in Hollywood at a at a film company. At a, oh, cool! So I had this 
this tangible person that was working right in the entertainment industry that I could say, yeah, that's a valid avenue for me to pursue. Sure. So it's I possible. did that. And then, so once I got through the sciences, I just dove right into to visual arts film and, and that's kind of where it, it went from there. And wow, I have an appreciation for all things herpetology. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, that, that, that road has closed. <laughs> yeah. Probably best. Different minds. How about, how about yourself? Was there anything when you were growing up that you thought for sure you were going to do and then things just switched and whether it was for good or bad? I'm one of those weird cases where like growing up, you know, when you're a kid, you change every week. It's like, I want to be a cowboy. I want to be an astronaut. Mm -hmm. I want to be those things. Mm -hmm. I've wanted to be an actor my entire life since I was three years old. Really? And it just like my mom tells a story that I was three years old. I walked into the living room one day and I was like, I want to be in movies. And it never switched. Like nothing ever grabbed me. Wow. Yeah. Here I'm, I'm in my 30s now. And it's it's always been that. And so you were you were involved in drama and in, in uh -huh. high school and all that kind of stuff. I was writing my own plays for my classes in like third grade, and my teacher would let me put them on. I did children's theater, four years of drama in high school, and then uh -huh. here we are. Wow! So nothing ever, sh nothing came across and thought you you like, oh, maybe I'm gonna flirt with this this idea for a little bit. Not even a little bit. Yeah, isn't that weird? Uh, wow! Good for you. Yeah, uh, it's a, a gift and a curse, I suppose. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's all the, all on your point of view, right? Yeah, yeah, I think so. So you're you're in college, mm -hmm. you want to you get to the science part, and you're like, that's a long equation, hard pass. Your sister's yep. in entertainment. Yep. Was there an avenue in entertainment that you were looking to get into? Was it always like production? Well, was it like any way I could get my foot in? Kind of that. Yeah. Um, I think I think people looking to get into entertainment. Mm -hmm. industry whether it's production post-production or or acting even if you will yeah i think the the tools and 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 the 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 barrier to get in is much lower now oh totally uh, you can you can make them you can I was about say you got a you whole can shoot, you can shoot a movie your phone. and yeah exactly <laughs> an iphone android phone you have you have your camera with different lenses you can edit you mm -hmm. can do all kinds of stuff yep there's Final Cut Pro, there's uh, Adobe Premiere, and then there's uh, DaVinci Resolve. And Resolve, you can download that for free. And it has a whole suite of color correction and sound. Accessibility is all-time yeah. high. When I was in college, you, you ha if you had a video camera, you could do things. But again, things were ultimately on film, and mm -hmm. film was expensive. Yeah. Uh, there wasn't, you know, YouTube wasn't out there. You couldn't just go yeah. on YouTube and figure out how, how do I do this? How do I cut music? How do I learn how to act? How do I shoot? And there's all kinds of people showing how to get a better cinematic shot with your iPhone. Yeah. Um, things like that. Things about composition, all that stuff. You kind of had to either learn on the job or, or have a, a, a good enough professor that would teach you these things. Yeah. Um, so how did I get to where I was? Uh, what what was your initial avenue that you wanted to pursue in the beginning? I think, again, so I think uh, edit. Yeah, <laughs> like any anybody. <laughs> sure. It was I wanted to direct. You sort oh, of cool. have these ideas that I think most anyone at that stage wanted to direct. I don't know many sure. wanted to be camera people or or editors. Mm, sure. We we did those things in my major. You had to have classes or you would have to do those things. Mm -hmm. But you were always you were always sort of the 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 leader of your own project or of your of your own thing. So you were sort of the director producer all in one. Right. That maybe I had a friend that could hold the camera for me, or uh, or I could sit in with a group if it was a group project, and we would all edit. So those things never really sort of hit me. Right. But then I also I didn't have a burning project that I wanted to do, and I didn't think that grad school or going to New York film school or or USC film school was in the cards for me. Mm -hmm. I just kind of felt like I just need to sort of get out there and kind of poke around and see what happens. There you go. And long story, trying to shorten a story here. I got, went to I LA. I like me long stories, well, Kevin. <laughs> also, well, okay. So after college, I moved back to the Bay Area. Uh -huh. At that time, the film industry wasn't in a position to teach sort of beginners or entry-level people because the companies here had were already established. Lucasfilm ILM, they were you kind of had to come in established. Uh, I think Pixar wasn't quite there yet. Pixar was doing 
the little short movies that you would see in animation festivals, but the the productions just weren't in equipped to to hey, here's a, a a production assistant newbie who wants to learn, like come in and learn. The place to do that was Southern California. Right. There's, there's the volume of work being done in Southern California. They're always looking for people, entry level people to do various things. Mm-hmm. So I, I moved down there, um, was visiting my sister at her her job. And uh, she put me in touch with some trailer houses and a, oh, tra- cool. a trailer house for you that don't know that is basically a loose term for a company that produces TV spots and, and movie trailers theatrically, whether it's for home video, theatrical television. Mm-hmm. Um, but while I was there doing that, I got asked that my sister's company was also the company that produced American Gladiators. Oh, sweet. So this woman walks by the office and sees me. She goes, how tall are you? And I'm like, oh, you know, six, six, one. She goes, you want a job on American Gladiators? And at that time, I didn't have a job. I'm like, sure. <laughs> so basically, if, you, if you've ever watched the show, I don't know if they, if they how long they kept it, but basically we were a spotter. We wore black sweatpants and, and polo shirts and we would spot the events if if something got knocked over we would have to run out there and, and fix it and set it back up and then get out of there before you got clobbered or you know, help, help the help the the gladiators or the athletes get into whatever at that time there were these giant sort of like i don't know what they'd call them battle sphere or these it looks like giant human uh gerbil balls right so yeah <laughs> help the person get into that or various things like that so i did that for I think we did that for three weeks and we shot two seasons worth of shows in three weeks. Whew. And then right after that, I, I got, had gotten hired by a trailer house. And then I started out as a, as a driver, a PA. There you go. That back then you had to take the tapes from the trailer house to whatever studio and drop it off. Everything was on these big three quarter inch tapes. And uh, you do that and you, or you'd pick up artwork from artists working on the posters and, and bring it back and forth. And, pick up kids from school and drop them off at the, you know, the owner's kids from school and drop them off. Or during Christmas time, you take the the Christmas presents and you give them to the various executives at at the studios and things like that. So it was a little bit of everything. And I was working with people that wanted to be actors. I was working with people that were there just on a summer job, other folks that wanted to, to really get into the entertainment industry like myself. So while I was there, I was, you know, you're sharing space with people that are editors. And you go down the ah. hall, you know, editing a trailer or a TV spot, and, and you or you'd hear it coming out of their room, and it was just interesting, and and it was just fascinating to me. And I just I just said to one editor one day, I said, "Hey, I'll buy a case of beer if you show me how to use the equipment." Good man. And, and, and he was really cool. He said, "You don't have to do. It. I'll show you how to do it, regardless." Oh, cool. And that was kind of it. And I sort of learned how to use the equipment, and then eventually I got promoted from being a driver to being to it being assigned to an editor who was working on film and the film editors we had film editors and we had editors on video oh. and the linear systems on video so the systems you would have multiple decks in your room and they would load the the tapes in there oh sure and so for the film editors they needed assistance to sort of keep track of things and to find things for them so okay um, that's what I was doing. And then things would go to finish. You'd, you'd cut sound on film. You'd go into a, a mixing stage with a box full of rolls of film or, or sound. You know, maybe you had 40 tracks of various things and, and music, sound effects, dialogue, narration, and you'd do that. And I was doing that. And then every once in a while, you'd get a TV spot and you'd try and cut it and show it to the producers. And if they liked it, they would pass it along to the client. And eventually they were essentially buying more and more of stuff that I was doing. So they just pulled me out of being an assistant and just made me an editor. And that's kind of the, kind of the, that's the path that I do. And then there's probably similar paths yeah. where people doing that because no one's just going to say, oh, you're an assistant, you know, bang, you're an editor. You're oh, yeah, of course. To, you're going to have to do your your edit- your assistant editor jobs. And and maybe if there's some downtime or some after hours time, you get a 15 second spot or a TV or a 30 second spot and you cut it. Mm-hmm. And the trailer houses are happy that they get extra stuff to to give towards the client. Sure. And then it's just sort of a, a way for you to sort of prove that you can do it or that you understand the process. And that was kind of it. You become, you become, you become the low level editor now and you kind of work your way up and that's kind of it. I love that you're like, you're going to college for herpetology. You get to the long equation. You're like, mm, the making yeah. of this is not really for me, but then assistant <laughs> editing, that's right. a lot of, that's a lot of work as well that you're doing. And then like putting in the extra time and then yeah. you're like, no, I want to do this. It's just yeah. when it, when it clicks, I guess, for the right people with the right thing. That's yeah. pretty cool. 
Yeah, it's in the time when I was doing it, it was by the time I was an editor, they made me an editor, the Avid Media Composer, digital editing was was every room in the in the building had an Avid. Oh, cool. Like, like all of the, the film. There were some film elements to it because ultimately at that point, you, there was no real easy way to get it digitally to film because right. still going to, if it was a theatrical trailer, we were still going to a stage and still projecting film and mixing uh from film gotcha uh, from from mag sound mag sound reels um yeah tv spots uh the television stuff was an early adopter on doing the full digital path so we would uh have stuff cut on the audio vision or whatever uh audio system you were working on to to edit sound and then you would take the media out and you could hand it off to the mix facility and then they would ingest it into their systems and then have all of your tracks there, and then they could mix that way. Oh, okay. Big sound stages, um, at least the one that we were using frequently, um, they were sort of, it took them a while to go from basically from analog to digital. Gotcha. Nowadays, it's all. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's been years that, that that's a long time ago. Do you ever think like, wow, we used to have to do this by hand, and now it is just click? Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> there, there's certain things that that I just think, man, it was so much harder to do on film. Yeah, uh, editing dialogue of all things, I think editing in general has become more sophisticated and more elaborate as thought processes change and I and new people come in and think of different ways of doing things. And and when I'm trying to think for for cutting dialogue, sometimes if if certain lengths or certain sentences were really long you would cut out the the empty space to sort of have it that sentence said faster, especially in a trailer or a TV spot where you have a, you have a certain amount of time you're trying to get a line in. Back then you would have to cut it on film, cut it and make sure it sounded right. Now with digital, you can just, oh, I'm just going to lift those two frames out, move it. And, and it's done like that. Yeah. And and then you sound and like, you know what? That sounds good, but it doesn't quite sound, I need it to be a little bit faster. So you can take that edited sentence and then, speed it up without changing the pitch right so i can speed it up 10 percent, maybe even 15 or 20 percent and that person will that line will be said in a much faster time and it fits in between let's say my music beats and it works whereas if it was on film you maybe either you couldn't do that or just had to think of a different way oof and once you make those cuts that's permanent then you got the scotch tape and your splicer and a whole yeah um, there, there's some of that stuff on display at work and I show yeah. people stuff. I go, I used to cut sound on those things. And some of the younger folks that are on my team, they look and I go, what? Yeah. <laughs> like, really? <laughs> but yeah. It's, it, that's how you did it. Yeah. Um, and I learned there was one editor, uh, when I was an assistant, uh, primarily cutting sound at that point, um, that I learned about shortening words. You could take a word. Oh, and it had a long consonant. And if let's, I'm trying to think of the best example, but if it was a long M, like if the person went something to do, yeah, right. If you wanted them to go something to do, you could take out, there were certain parts of that M sound that you could cut out. Oh, and, they were doing, and they were doing that on videotape on the linear systems. Really? And, it just blew my mind. And I thought, man, because it's just a, another way of looking at it. And now to me, it just seems so obvious and, and, and second nature that once I learned that you could do that, I'm like, oh, okay. So now digitally, it's super easy to do that, right? Sure. So there's all kinds of like little tricks that you could do and, and you could pull out easy to pull out um, mouth clicks and pops and things like that uh, digitally because in the, in the audio vision, you could, you could get down to the sample and pull out those sure things. not not so much with the media media composer still frame by frame but it still helps whereas if it was on mag film and you were cutting dialogue you would have to sit there and you would have to cut it out or if you wanted to do a, a, a fade off of a, of a word or something like that uh you would you would are you familiar with what that would look like basically yeah. oh yeah it's a piece of 35 millimeter film and it has that the mag strip on it yes mm -hmm. you would take paper tape which was an editor's friend uh -huh. you, you would basically tape a diagonal on that and then you would take acetone and wipe off the the mag so basically there was just less mag information hitting the playhead so it would fade 
right? So, so, so as it as it moved across the playhead, it was just would get quieter and fade. So it was <laughs> stuff like that. And then now now it's literally just place my playhead and then hit. I have a key. Fade to head. Fade to tail. And and that's Boom. it. <laughs> yeah. So crazy. I, I worked at a movie theater as one of my first jobs and we did, okay. we still had film. All right. So we would do the three deck uh, projector and we'd have to feed it through. And the manager, mm -hmm. when we got the new cans in from the studios would have to splice the reels together mm -hmm. and that a whole thing. So I actually still have, there's a little tote there that has a red okay. lid. There's a bunch of trailers in there from oh, my cool. theater days. Oh, fun. So when you're talking about film and like audio track stuff, I'm like, I know exactly what you're talking right, about. Right, right, right. And, and, and sometimes the trailers would have a mag track and sometimes they would have an optical track. People don't know what that is. But I guess it's like trying to tell people like what an eight track is and like, well, we used to have cassette tapes. You're like, what? Right. It's craziness. Right. <laughs> Dude. So what brought you out of LA into back to the Bay Area then? Um, my wife got headhunted to work on Clone Wars. Nice. That'll do it. She was working at Disney TV Animation. Cool. The the folks in charge of Clone Wars. Catherine Winder, Dave Filoni, and Henry Gilroy were the, Henry was the head writer at that point. Sure. Mm -hmm. They were sort of, I guess they were powwowing, trying to figure out who to, how to staff up the division and who, who sure. they would get. And all three of them had worked with, knew my wife from various. Oh, cool. My, my wife had worked with Catherine Winder when, when she was at Warner, uh, Hanna-Barbera. Mm-hmm with henry when he was a writer on one of the other shows that my wife had worked on and and dave um knew uh i knew through hockey and yeah and through and then michelle knew him my wife knew him through disney tv animation so they they sort of all three of them independently thought of of my wife nice uh, to 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 fill this one position and and we're, we're both from northern california technology was at the point where I could sort of be a freelance editor at home. It was a little bit different. Not, not the, the internet speeds weren't, weren't quite right. <laughs> or, or, or at least home internet speeds were not right as fast sure. as, as business, but civilian um, internet. <laughs> right. So we just, and we just took the leap and, and she was on Clone Wars for a while. And then I was sort of freelance Mr. Mom for a while. Get it. And, uh, yeah. And, and that's kind of what got us up here. And then I was lucky enough to my reel landed on the right person's desk who nice talking to someone over at Lucasfilm who was looking for an editor that does the kind of stuff that I do. Yeah. And, and I was working at another, this other place in the East Bay and this guy was the lead editor there. And he says, Oh, you need to talk to this guy. That's, that's just outside. And as luck would have it, that, that, job that I was on had basically put me on hi hiatus because I was a freelancer and they said, we don't have any work for you right now. So yeah, you can take some time off. And then literally the next day the phone rang and it was, it was someone from Lucasfilm. And I went in that day and, and, and brought my reel in and, and kind of got hired on the spot. It was, yeah, it was pretty, pretty awesome. Wow. Yeah. Dude. Do you remember your first assignment? Uh, is it an assignment or is there like a, like at a community center, you pull a tag and you're like, I'll do this one. <laughs> I, yeah, I, I don't, I don't know what it was for, what it was. It basically had footage of, it was sort of like a pop culture kind of piece on Star Wars and sort of, okay, yeah, it had concept art for the game, The Force Unleashed. Cool. Uh, it had a lot of fans for some, from some of the premieres right okay uh, one of those like packages yeah. yeah 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 gosh i boy that's a good question i i, I see it in my brain but I, I only see sort of a few shots of the piece and i don't quite know what what it was for but were you nervous um a little yeah i think yeah. at that time it was a sort of a, a two-week project i was sort of I was free. I wasn't, I get, I should back up. I wasn't hired staff. I was hired as a freelancer. Okay. Smart. For, the, for this specific project. So I did it. And, and he said, you know, I'm trying to build up this division. If things work out, you know, you can, you can stay. Sure. Uh, you know, if people, basically if people like you and they like your work, you can right. stay. Right. Um, a little probationary period. Yeah. So essentially you're on, yeah, you're on a trial period. Um. So that, worked out and then you would get another project and that, and you just get more and more as, as one project ended, you would get another project. 
Um, at that time, that division was really small. It was myself, one other editor, and the guy running the department. And I think maybe an assistant editor. Wow. Um, and it was there was no it wasn't a digital workflow. It was still uh, tape or 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 digital tape like D. Gosh, what is it? It's not. It wasn't D fives, but it was a digital, and you still had to ingest it. Uh, you know, go through and pull your selects and things like that. And then when it would go to final, you would redigitize it at a higher, at a, at a better compression rate. Interesting. But yeah, yeah. So that that happened, and 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 I figured like, well, I'm I'm only here for, I could only be here maybe only a couple of weeks. It didn't yeah. matter. And so I. I was just basically talking to everybody and, and saying hi to everybody because I didn't know if I was going to stick around. Yeah, so I was. Um, here, here's a here's a funny story. I um, I was taking the shuttle to work, and the Lucasfilm is in the Presidio. And one evening, I'm I'm leaving work, and there's some guys there, and I can I've seen them around. I can tell that they work at ILM, and I'm sort of so I'm just like, I want. What do you guys do? And one of the guys said, I'm a technical director. And I, to this day, I couldn't tell you what a technical director does in the VFX. <laughs> Maybe you know, Brian, you've, you've talked to so many they people. They direct technology, Kevin. Right. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so with the street traffic and everything like that, I heard tentacle director. <laughs> okay. And That's at fair. the time, That's at ILM. And it, well, at the time, <laughs> Pirates of the Caribbean was out. Davy Jones. Makes sense. Make, okay. I'll back you up on this. Uh, one. So, <laughs> so he says that I'm like, oh, that's cool. So, like, you you direct all the 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 tech on David Jones, and, and he looked at me like I was from Mars. And, he, and his friends and his friends standing next to him starts chuckling and starts covering his mouth and like doing like trying to be polite, just not bust out laughing. And and he looks at me, and in my brain, I think he's looking at me incredulously, but I I don't know. And he just goes, no, technical director. And I went. Oh, okay. <laughs> and and that's sort of like when the when the conversation <laughs> stops and you kind of oh, no. everyone's kind of looking at you look around like, oh, oh look, there's there's some trash on the ground. I'm gonna go pick <laughs> that up. <laughs> You're like somehow technical director makes even less sense to me. <laughs> so yeah, that was amazing. Hey, you still that, there? That was just, yeah. <laughs> so that was that was part of me just talking to anybody and everybody. How much of what you're doing is uh, like specifically asked for when making a trail, like we need this and this, this, this versus how much is like instinct. You're like, I, when you're making your selects, like this is what I'm thinking. This is what I'm thinking. Like you're going with your gut. It's a, it's a mix. Is it's it? a mix. Okay. Yeah. That sometimes, sometimes they'll have really specific ideas on what types of things they want included. Oh. Uh, or, or what vibe they want portrayed. Mm, sure. Other times it could be, I really like this line or this scene. Gotcha. But it's up to you to sort of figure out where how that would fit in. Sure. Um, there's been times where I'm thinking of this music cue. It, it would get together and you talk with the folks. And and one of the things is like, I really like this music cue. I think this could be something cool to use. So you're like, okay. So you, you take that as a, as a launch point and either you use that cue or you have, you search for something that's like that because it's, it's a cue from a property that that Lucasfilm doesn't own. So you find something that's that's has that similar vibe and similar orchestration or or, or similar build, right? Um, so you, that would happen. Other times it's and it could be a trailer, it could be something for licensing. I mean, we do all kinds of stuff. We have public facing material from trailers to to content that's for celebration to internal only stuff that that no one outside of the company will see because. We're trying to to show potential licensees, you know, look how awesome Star Wars is. Yeah. Things like that. And so sometimes it's we need this piece for for licensing, just just go and and then you kind of do it. And sometimes it's I think like anything creative, sometimes you gotta sort of ask questions to your producers and like, did you have any idea? What are you thinking? And you kinda there's kind of a, a dialogue back and forth to sort of figure out something and then you go. Other other times Producers can be really, really involved and really helpful, especially if it's a piece where there's a lot of talking heads or if a lot of times with the behind the scenes content that we create for any of the movies or the TV shows, it could be a, a 10 minute piece, but there's a lot of talking heads and things like oh, that. Sure. You get transcripts and, and producers and, and the, the sort of the, the person sort of in charge of that project that who you would go to, uh, to show your initial cut to they'll have ideas and, and back and forth. What about this line? Oh yeah. I remember, you know, uh, this person said 
haven't talked about this subject so that and so you you get all those things together and stuff like that so it's really it can be really collaborative and i think and other times you can just be left to your own devices just to come up with something and it's it's been a little bit of everything for me that's cool and that's that's what's great um and I think it's nice because if if you're having a, a particular hiccup or you can't quite you know crack the code of what you're trying to do, mm -hmm. it's easy enough to just say, "Hey, you know, help me out. Like, what are you thinking about this? And um, do you have any ideas?" And the person will say, "Oh, no, you're you're on the right path." Or or how about this line? Maybe this line would be a better in place of that. And you're like, "Aha!" And then it just clicks. And then yeah, stuff like that. So it's it's really great. I mean, it could be. I think it. You know, it's like acting. Sometimes. I'm not an actor, but I would assume, you know, sometimes it's it's up to you to figure this out, or sometimes you you get ideas and from other people. Oh yeah, um, from from a director or producer or a writer or other actors, like, hey, mm -hmm. have you thought about doing it this way, and you're like, oh, I never thought of that, and and oh that. yeah, but then it's but then there is the there is that that kind of marriage of the two, right? Because you want to be able to express yourself creatively and like have your ideas, but mm -hmm. there are times when what is it like paralyzed by possibility. It's like if you have no heading or anything, then you're like, oh, can I get like just something? So like I'm guessing getting a yeah, vibe or like yeah. a mood like really yeah. helps. Yeah, I think sometimes it's you put it really great. It's sometimes you feel sort of paralyzed by all of the ideas you could potentially do. And then you start trying to edit in your head without actually putting it down, you know, digitally in the timeline and start putting things together. And that's sort of leads into there's times where I start projects and I think I don't even know what I'm doing. Really? Oh yeah. There's like, there's a Ooh. huge, a huge imposter syndrome sometimes. Dude, the best people have it. I've found. I'll get stuff. And and I think like, I've done this many times. Like, why do I feel frozen? And, yeah. and I think, oh man. And then, so you, you just kind of work through it. And, and for me, the, the creative bell curve is really steep. Mm-hmm. And then once I sort of figure it out, then it just kind of, it flows. It's a momentum based. Once it's like, once yeah. you get going, then you're like, oh, 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 okay, cool, cool, cool. Mm -hmm. But getting going is Yeah, some, sometimes, and other times you, I know exactly, oh, this is what, exactly what I want to do. I want to start this. Yeah. That. Um, other times you just kind of sit there and go, hmm, how am I going to do this? Sure. Um, how much creative freedom do you get? Like on average, do you say you get to kind of just, see what happens versus how much is it time-based because you do have x amount of time to work with in in terms of the, the length of the piece or just how much time to like i'm given four days to do something i guess do you approach projects differently on how you do things based on the length of the timeline you have to work with like do you approach a 60 second spot differently than a 30 second spot uh no really okay cool you just have more stuff to to play around with and got it or, okay or may, it might be for a 60, you have more time to sort of maybe play out a, a gag or a moment from the, the show or the movie, whereas a oh, 30 yeah. is like really, sometimes 30s have sort of a, a scene to it or two scenes to it, mm -hmm. but usually that is just bang, bang, bang. It's quick. Yeah. Um, if, you, if you watch 30s for for theatrical, well, you know, TV spots have really changed too over, over the years, but on a 30, it's, it's dialogue line, explosion, music hit music hit explosion dialogue line you know stop down no silence cool moment music hit you know it's there's yeah. always there's always <laughs> there's something a happening yeah and and it's the same with with a 60 but you get a little bit more time to sort of maybe be creative and then for trailers and and i'm saying this across all genres of trailers and things like that you can the editor can become more creative and and there's there's lots of really really talented editors out there that that do some really cool stuff, and yeah. I think for a movie you want the editing to basically be seamless, right? You don't want to mm -hmm. notice that it's gimmicky editing. Sure, but, but for a trailer, off often that the editing style sort of helps dictate what's going on. You you, you look at the the Fast and the Furious movies, or you you look at the the trailer for for snatch wait you know from you know, this is old so you know there's lots of things that have sort of a style to even so a lot of the the horror trailers texas chainsaw the the remake is that's a really that's a really really popular sort of at that point that was really sort of groundbreaking mm -hmm. on how that was being done so that the those movies 
And what's another one? Atomic Blonde. The trailer for oh, Atomic yeah. Blonde has it's it's really musical and in, in how how things happen and it's got a great soundtrack but things happen on the beat but then they don't happen on every beat it's like every other beat there's something it's like it's like bang pause bang you know to the beat i don't know it's it's cool yeah worth taking a look and so yeah so there's there's guys out there that are just wicked talented doing what they do in trailers and but uh, you know oftentimes you know those guys get free reign or maybe they're being collaborative with with someone else you know a producer in-house or whatnot yeah it, it really just sort of depends so, sometimes you you get stuff and your producer is busy with another project so you're just kind of you're just going along and right hope this works kinda, yeah <laughs> but that's the process you show it to them they they give you notes you go back and you, you show those and then maybe get some more notes and then you get it to a point where everyone likes it and then you show it to the higher ups and you cross your fingers that they don't have notes, but oftentimes they will. Uh huh. And it's just, it's it's possible. It's a process. So that's probably what keeps it interesting, right? That collaboration. Everything's different. It's like yeah, yeah. And then when when it hits all the marks and and you know everyone's happy, that's a good thing. Yeah. Do you have a trailer or something that you've made that like you're really proud of? Like this one, I like it has a special place in my heart. Ooh. Because I find as artists, we're the most critical of our own work. Yeah, and we know how it's made, so we're also seeing something different than somebody else's. Right, so like if right. you can find something you are proud of, like that's a really big deal. Right. Um, there's stuff that I look at to that point. There's stuff I look at now, and I think, why did I do that? I bet oh, that's like, <laughs> oh, what a, that's the wrong. Dis- that's a horrible decision. Yeah. Or, or or it'll be that's just too long. Why did why did I make that so long? I could have cut out this, and it could have been twenty seconds shorter. That happens. Um. Ooh, what do I like? Boy, I think I really like Clone Wars. It's that's tough because I did so many. I, I'm gonna probably sure. miss a number of those. And I bet they all combine too in your head because it's like at, at similar times, properties, yeah. similar vibes. I want to say Clone Wars season five. Ooh, if if that's the one, yeah, yeah, that's the one. Clone Wars season five when stuff gets really real. So Clone Wars season five trailer is one that I really like. That, okay, okay. Um, just because I was using John Williams music for most of it. Cool. And I was able to just sort of blend certain cues together. Sure. Uh, and I think like, if you're a fan of the Clone Wars, like that's, that's when stuff really started. I mean, it was cool up to then, but that's when things really got crazy. Yeah. Uh, in a good way. Agreed. And that was, that was another one. That's a long one. That's, that's over, that's almost three and a half minutes. And that nice. was a cele- that was for celebration. And that nice. was another cool thing is that, the celebration trailers always allowed us to go a little bit longer. Cool. Because, you know, the fans are there and right. It's they, an experience. They, right. And they, and they pay money to be entertained or to see something that they wouldn't normally see, mm-hmm. you know, play to the room and you get a little bit longer. Yeah. There's that one. And then in another Clone Wars one was the, actually the, the there was one for the hundredth episode. We did a, did a, a special trailer for the hundredth episode of Clone Wars, and that sort of I had to sort of combine elements of other trailers and and just storylines and things Ooh. like that. And that that was a tough one to do, and that one went together well. I, that yeah. one, and then in Rebels, yeah, probably season two uh, trailer is probably my favorite. Yeah, uh, with Rex and and Vader. yeah, that's probably the big reveal. Yeah, that's that was my favorite. That's a good one. Yeah, for a lot of reasons too, because I've I've said this before. My wife is a huge Rex fan. And cool. She's on. She she always says I'm I'm the orig- I'm the original Rex fan. Yeah. <laughs> Own it. Get because in there. You know, she was on the show. She worked on the show, and yeah. So when when he was coming back, I, I couldn't say anything. So we were all myself and and my family we were at celebration. We were sitting back in the audience when that played and when he says my name's rex captain you know yeah. that and my you know she just lost it that was yeah <laughs> <laughs> that's so cool yeah so um that that's a favorite of mine fair picks yeah and then then there's there's you know there's some other couple other rebels ones but i think those are the ones that really stand out for me yeah our favorites on the other side of the coin are there ones that like were super challenging and you're like i'm just i'm glad i finished that one hmm 
I would, uh, I think Clone Wars season three. Yeah. Trailer for celebration that because I was only given two and a half days to do that. Oh <gasps> yeah. Good. N- good thing you had practice before at that moment. Well, I, um, <laughs> so I, I had, I had, let me back up. I had broken it down. Basically I had looked at it and sort of pulled my selects Okay, and then they said, we want to see a cut in, I think it was like a Monday. We said, we want to see a cut in a day Wednesday. And I was just, Oh, that's fast. Okay. <laughs> and I went, oh, okay. <laughs> and yeah, then there you go. Yes. And I got it done and, you know, knock on wood that I, I don't even remember if, how many, if any changes were made to that one. I'm sure there were, but that what you see on screen is, is probably 90% of what that first edit was. And that, so that one, it's, it's not, it's it could, I would say that the beginning of that one is really cool too. Just the way it starts out in the water and then it comes up on the, on the characters and how the music is developing. But yeah, that one was, <laughs> there was some anxiety on that one, just yeah. <laughs> trying to get that up, trying to get that done. Yeah. So that, that's one that, that was scary only because of the short deadline. Sure. Yeah. It makes sense. I think there's always projects that come and maybe there's moments in every project where you think, how am I going to get past this? And, and, yeah. and again, you, you know, I'm not a surgeon, I'm not a lawyer, I'm not a police officer, I'm not a fireman. I, you know, right. We're creating fun here. I'm, you know, no one's life is in the balance of what I do. So, you know, I do take it with a grain of salt that, okay, I'm having a rough day, but I'm not, right. I'm not kicking down a door in a fire in a burning building to, to rescue. Yeah, so <laughs> perspective. Right. So, <laughs> yeah. And I, and I think like, like anyone who's, who does anything creative, whether it's what we do, you know, in their entertainment world, or maybe you're a writer or an artist, or maybe you, you build hot rods or, or, or who knows what, yeah. um, you, you have these moments of, of creative hiccups, um, totally writer's block, if you will. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, it's true. Yeah. Those, those can be scary, but I, I, I found that oftentimes if, if I'm having that, I'll just move to a different part of the trailer or, or the spot and just kind of work on that. Oh, that's or, smart. I can't figure this out. So maybe I'll just, I know I want this scene to, to, to be in it somewhere. So maybe I'll cut that piece Mm -hmm. and, and kind of work on that. And then, and then I'll try and get the connective tissue between this moment and this moment and how that happens or, or I'll work on music or maybe I'm not happy with music and I'll just go back to listening to more music, trying to find the right cue. Actually, you've got like different fades, you got cues, all kinds of stuff. What do you think if if possible, mm-hmm. what makes a good trailer? Like, is there an answer to that question? Like, are there are there elements that like uh, um, trailers need this? Oh, that's a good one. I you know I don't know. I think for me personally, mm-hmm. music is really good, or or yeah. sound design, sound design is really good. I don't know if you could say it needs I think what it needs to do, and this is really sort of sort of generic. It needs to just get someone excited about what what it is that you're trying to sell yeah. you're selling a product you're you're sure you're creating something really cool to sort of get someone excited to see a movie or a tv show right so if it does that then that's what it you know that's what it needs i don't i like that though that's, that's like, good um, but i i've i've cut stuff with one music cue and it, it it's it's okay but it just doesn't quite feel right and then you change the music mm-hmm. and all of a sudden everything just works and, yeah. And so from my experience, it's 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 the music cue. If you can get the right music cue, because sometimes the music dictates the pace, dictate the the mood. But then this also gets me back to what I was talking about, how sound editing and picture editing has gotten so sophisticated over the years that there's editors that are, are doing really cool audio manipulation with with getting stems of tracks. You get a, a cue and you have all the different stems. And maybe mm-hmm. you'll drop out the voices or you'll drop out the guitar or the strings. And then you have sort of the underscore and then you do various things. And dude, there's guys that are people that are sort of deconstructing other songs and using that uh, sort of trailerizing popular songs, if you will. And, and oh, yeah. And doing all that. So, I mean, for me, it's, it's it's music sound design. I think that's 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 key. I think there's a primal thing with human beings and music because mm-hmm. you can feel something, but then the second music gets involved, you're like, oh, like, yeah, it's almost magic because you can make someone feel something with music. Oh, for sure. Yeah. yeah. 
wild. I mean, there's there's cues that that I listen to or songs that I listen to, and like instantly they sort of make my eyes get yeah same eyed. And it and it could just be an upbeat song, but it for whatever I have this connection to it that it reminds me of a certain time in my life. And some sometimes it's the the pitch of the person singing. Ooh, that, I don't yeah. know, like like there's something and. Maybe maybe I'm I'm weird that way, but sometimes there's a certain <laughs> certain pitch that that happens, and it just it seems so melancholy or so sorrowful to me that I'm just I just it just hits me. Yeah, just connects. There's a, there's something underneath there that you're picking up. But that's the power of music, right? And yeah, and yeah, I, I can't explain. It. I can't put it into words. It, there'll just be times I hear a song. I'm like, damn. <laughs> yeah, same. All right, okay, I'm not alone. Yeah, no, 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 <laughs> not at all. <laughs> there are times it'll sneak up on me. I'll be like, it's fine. And then I'll hear something be like, ooh, oh, oh, right. ow. So that's actually a very good note for anyone who's like trying to make trailers, be like music cues is a good good resource. Is there, uh, are there foundations that somebody who wants to get into trailer editing that you think are really important to like know how to do these things and they will serve you well later on? Ooh, I'm sure, I'm sure there's... <laughs> Boy, I, these these kind of questions I always find <laughs> tough to answer because I'll I'll see interviews or, or read articles from from other editors and they're talking about trailer editing in the greatest most advanced way and <laughs> and, and 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 they're far more articulate than I am and I think about it and sometimes I'm sort of for me sometimes it's a, it's just a mood thing and a feel thing and yeah totally and a trial and error thing and maybe there's things that I do innately mm -hmm. learned or a learned innate thing over the years that are essential, but I don't think of them as, as these things that are essential because they just, I just sort of feel like I have to do them. Yeah. It makes sense. I think being able to tell a story in a short amount of time is key. Ooh, that's good. Especially nowadays you know, the voice of God narrator is, is hardly ever used. Oh yeah. <laughs> and so you, you kind of have this three act where you, there's the, the intro, then there's sort of the, the conflict and then there's the resolution right. of, of a trailer. I think a lot of young editors that are, they're doing trailers now have a really good command of music. And this is one of those things where I feel like I've had to sort of play catch up because coming up, there's people that are, the the music that they're involved in or the, that they're using in the trailers with this with the split out tracks and the stems and things like that is it's much more advanced than when I was first starting out where it was sure. find the cue from such and such movie and there were a few library guys out there creating bespoke music for trailers and and theatrical marketing now there's there's lots of guys out there and some of those music guys came from cutting trailers and some of those trailer oh. editors, you know came from doing music so they have this really great command of of music and and things like that i don't know, i think when you look at at a piece just sort of knowing that that's a trailer moment that's a trailer line oh yeah training yourself to like pick up yeah, those you things. just kind of like oh i would totally use that in a trailer i think with anything just being able to and this isn't an, isn't an editorial thing. It's it's just being able to to get notes and and changes and being able to to handle that and then and then move forward with your next version of whatever you're working on. Yeah, I uh, boy, I, I I had a sneaky <laughs> suspicion you might ask me something like this. I don't know, <laughs> and I always feel like I'm not the right person to answer that just because a lot of what I do, I've sort of done, I've learned through trial and error, and just kind of yeah kind of through feel i've never had this mentor that had showed me had shown me how to do things and saying these are the, the key factors you just kind of right you kind of dive in you kind of learn how to swim that way yeah Ooh, I, i'll have to get back to you on that i want um honestly that's a solid answer because okay. it, it boils down to you need to trust yourself you need to get okay. in there and get your hands okay. dirty and learn mm -hmm. on the spot like it's worked out for you pretty right. well kevin <laughs> but 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 that said, there are definite things that that a, a trailer will need certain right, types. Totally, of um, and different trailers will need different things. Yeah, well, have different people be collaborative. Right. In that case, on a technical aspect, 
what programs should someone be learning how to use? Like, what's the industry standard these days? Like, know how to do this. I don't know the industry standard, but I do know okay. that, that Avid Media Composer and Premiere Pro okay. uh, and DaVinci Resolve are, are perfect. Are, I, I do know that some people still use Final Cut Pro X, I think is the current version. Mm -hmm. I don't know how prevalent that is, but sure. the, those other three programs, I you look at a lot of, and it's not necessarily theatrical trailers and things like that, but just a lot of editorial jobs. It's They're asking about Premiere. Interesting. Okay. That's good to know. Because uh, Premiere has that integration with the graphics and, and, right. and all of that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. But I'm not sure how the, that program handles large projects. I think- good point. When you're when dealing with lots and lots of media, I think Avid is still the king with that. Yeah, I think, I think so if, if you were if you were just doing something on your own, and and you and your your friends or or you had you're cutting a music video or you're cutting a a, a corporate video or, or something where you just have a, a certain amount of footage, I think Premiere is 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 probably the way to go. I've used DaVinci Resolve on some home projects. And cool. the nice thing about, on the nice thing about that is you can just throw any footage into the timeline and it'll immediately figure out all the parameters of you don't have to set up your project. Oh, cool. So with media compose, you have to tell it I'm working in this frame rate, I'm working at this resolution and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. With, with, and probably premiere is probably that way too, but I've, I just haven't used premiere. In sure. Ages. But with Resolve, you would just take whatever clip, whether it's shot on your iPhone or or a video camera or or whatnot, and just throw it in the timeline, and just boom, it just knows. It knows the frame rate, it knows uh, the codec, all that kind of stuff. So, and then you can mix and match too. You can have different ones in the same timeline, and it and it works okay. Oh. But again, I don't know how that handles large amounts of media. You, you can imagine, like what we're doing is we'll get tons of i mean we have all the the feature films that that the company has made we have mm -hmm. those accessible online all the tv shows that we can pull from at any different time plus all of the footage that we may shoot at an event any sort of footage that we may shoot for behind the scenes things that we're creating so there's there's a very very large volume of media that we have to have accessible to sure mul to multiple editors and often at the same time there's you know, it could be a project where you have Four, ed four or five editors working on one project, accessing some of the same media. And I think Avid is still pretty much the king. Okay. But I, th I think if I think if, if someone was in, was in high school and they learned either Promote or Premiere and Resolve, they would be okay. I, I love that. But, and also editing is still, editing is editing. So it's just a matter of the type of tools you're working on. So I'm sure a Premiere editor could sit there and over a period of time, learn how to use Media Composer or Resolve and vice versa. So Use what you have access to and then get in there. Figure mm -hmm. it out. You got just this. Get, learn by doing. Learn Sometimes. by doing. Honestly, that works. I love it. Kevin, just like that, we've been talking for over an hour and a half. Look at that. You survived. Cool. Wow. Congratulations. Right. <laughs> I feel like there's still more to talk about. Um, <laughs> there always but... is. I love that you, one, I love that this happened, that we could hang out again. But two, anyone who wants to get into trailers, like you're such a resource. And there's so many things, like you said, imagine a high school kid listening and being like, they're getting, they're getting tips and stories from Kevin Yost. I mean, dude, we're we talking about. And, and I'm, I'm just, I'm just one of, and like I said, there's a lot of super talented people out there that have way more insight yeah. <laughs> and, and, and than I do. I honestly, I, you know, I don't, I don't pretend to be the, the ultra expert on this. Sure. Um, I, I'm just speaking to, to my experience, which is all we can do. I think if you were just, I don't know. No, I would imagine if you were to search in the internet, you could probably find some interviews with with some trail editors out there or that are that have done some really cool stuff and and learn from them and and how they go about doing it. And yeah, you as well, pal. Oh, well, thank you. <laughs> yeah, I I sort of it's funny. I sort of feel like I'm sort of this person that lives in like two spectrums of 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 nerddom. I'm like I like sure. love sports and I play sports, but I also am. Star Wars, Lord of the Rings, like we didn't even get into that stuff, right? <laughs> Star Dude. Wars, Lord of the Rings, kind of <laughs> video games thing. I like, I like, I'm doing that too, you know. So yeah, yeah, it's one of my favorite things about <laughs> you. You've got, you've got layers, Kevin. <laughs> All right. Now, before I release you back into the wild, I gotta ask, where can okay. people find you online? Where can they find your stuff? 
Talk to me. Let's see. You could find me online. I have, I just have Instagram now. Perfect. And, and Nothing wrong with that. It's trailer underscore underscore dude. Love it. On Instagram. So trailer under, underscore underscore dude. And I only have a handful of posts on there. <laughs> um, I, yeah, I, I, I dropped out of Twitter. Uh, it just, it just. Understandable. It's just, yeah, it was just too much. And All right. so that's that. That's where I am there. Where can you find my stuff? I think you could just kind of search starwars.com has yeah. a lot of stuff. Um, <laughs> just keep watching Star Wars. <laughs> yeah. I, you know, I don't, I, you know, so much of, gosh, I've been there a while. And so everything I've done for the most part is either on starwars.com or there's might even be a sort of a bootleg version of, of something that I've done that <laughs> is, has, it wasn't released. So that's when you know you've made it when there's bootlegs. Yeah. I've for, for the rebels, I've done all but one or two of the, of the pieces. I think there was a season one piece for rebels that I did not do. And then I think one of the, the last sort of TV spots for rebels, I did not do. I didn't do, I didn't do any of the TV spots. Like if you saw TV spots for rebels, I didn't, I didn't do those. I did okay. stuff I was okay. doing was, was trailers, celebration trailers, mid season trailer, finale trailer, those, those kinds of things. And the same thing with Clone Wars. Hence the trailer underscore underscore dude. Love it. If you're, like again, the the hundred episode one is my favorite. The season five Clone Wars trailers are my favorite, and there's a, there's a Rebels one trailer, and I'm just for the life of me, I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if um, it's a Rebels trailer, you did yeah, it. Yeah. And this is this has been the biggest gift for me with creating the show is that people know your work, and now they're gonna get to know you, and I just love that. Oh, cool! Thanks. That's what I do. Well, I wanted I wanted to ask you some more questions, but I guess I have to wait for another time. I yeah, exactly. Know. Now you got to come back, <laughs> <laughs> Kevin. You're the best, and I appreciate you very much. Awesome, thank you. Hey. And... Hello, friends. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of The Interesting Podcast. If you'd like to follow the show and stay up to date on new episodes, it's at Pod of Interest on Twitter and Instagram. If you'd like to follow me, I'm at Jedi Brian on all social media sites. You can also find me at BrianBalance.com. There you'll find my demos, recent projects, and other stuff I'm up to. If you enjoyed this episode, please share it and tell your friends. A good rating or review always helps and is greatly appreciated. Let the people know we've got some cool stuff going on over here. Speaking of cool stuff, we now have merch. Just search The Interesting Podcast on TeePublic to pick you up some sweet gear. And if you'd like to support the show more directly and get early releases while you're at it, you now have that option over at patreon.com slash jedibrian. On that note, special thanks to Ben, Chris, Daryl, Daz, and Victor. Your support means so much to me, and I can't tell you how much I appreciate it. So until next time, be well.